everyone, and welcome to another episode of I Never Knew or Inc. podcast with Life Coach Maureen. I'm so happy to have all of you here. Thank you, listeners, for all of your wonderful five-star reviews. We're gaining traction. Be sure to share this with your friends because the guests that I have are absolutely priceless. My guest today, I'm so excited. I came across this wonderful gentleman and what his topic is and his his subject matter is, is near and dear to my heart. Uh, So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about him. This is William Allen. He is a first time author with a writer's heart and a researcher's mind. After getting a degree in psychology with an eye on doing psychology research, He calibrated for a career in information technology. Isn't that funny how we pick careers that are so Oh, it is. It's crazy. (laughs) So far away from our emotional selves. And I was there too. I quit corporate in last December in something I hated and pursued my my coaching and and, um, speaking um, full time. So William found himself in information technology. He was in a 30-year career. Uh, He was a manager at Wells Fargo who enjoyed managing highly intelligent, often difficult staff. We've all had those, many of whom were highly sensitive. And going forward, listeners, we're going to talk HSP, which means highly sensitive persons, if you haven't heard that term. So he was awarded a prestigious corporate management excellence award for his empathetic management style, which is very rare if anyone has worked in corporate as I have. So William retired early from his corporate job to found his hypno coaching and neurofeedback brain training business, Brain Pilots in Bend, Oregon, which I hear is gorgeous. He co-organized the area's first introvert, highly sensitive person discussion group. In late 2016, he began his blog, The Sensitive Man, about his experiences as a highly sensitive man. The blog became the genesis for his book, Confessions of a Sensitive Man, and we're going to hear more about what's in his book. So the, the bottom line that's beautiful about William is he is shedding light on highly sensitive males and the much needed role they take in our society. Welcome, William. Thank you, thank you, Maureen. Good to be here. I I am so happy to have you here. This is near and dear to my heart because I am A, in a house full of men right now, and B, I raised my children, two daughters and a son as a single parent. His father was not uh, empathetic whatsoever and was not really involved. So trying to raise a male when you're a female, trying to, mm-hmm. you know, insert that sensitivity, which now has come to fruition at 23 years old. He's very sensitive and the best partner for, for his uh, fiance. And then also now I'm raising a 14 year old grandson. <laughs> so wow. it's, it's a cyclic thing that I'm repeating. And so this, this is just so near and dear to me. And I think you're hitting on something that hasn't been touched on enough because we're finally in this area of awareness that it's okay to feel. Most of my life coaching clients are males. And I right. love my, my men so much because it takes a long time to get them to, um, oh, it takes a long time to get them to come for help. But once they do, man, they are fast trackers. They're like, what do I do, Maureen? What do I do? As, as opposed to my women who are a little more hesitant to change. Right. So we're going to jump right in and you're going to tell us how did this come to be? And let's, since it is, I never knew we start with our story first. Tell us about your evolution to realizing how important this subject is. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's something that's probably in the last 30 years, Um, Dr. Elaine Aaron wrote a wonderful book called The Highly Sensitive Person, which is basically sort of sharing with the world what this thing is. This is a personality or temperament trait called sensory processing sensitivity. So it is a thing. It's and it's not a disorder. It's not a dysfunction. It is just like extroversion, introversion, that kind of stuff. It's a trait, right? 
And there are things that are associated with the trait that uh, highly sensitive people have. And the interesting thing, Maureen, is that it's, you know, it's probably 25 to 30 percent of the human population has this trait. Half of those, half of that 20, 35 percent are men. OK, and this is not something, you know, typically guys really don't want to be identifying with the term sensitive. It's a real difficult thing for them to do. But what, what I've been trying to do with the book and others like myself who are working with the highly sensitive men is to sort of re-engineer what this term means, the sensitive term means. It's not bad and it's not a bad thing. And we need to have sort of a better handle on this so that those men, especially those men who are sensitive, can, can sort of stand up and embrace the trait. And I think if they do that, it's a kind of a relief. It's, it's, it's something that allows them to be more of themselves, be more empathetic, more nurturing, intuitive, and all those good things that go along with high sensitivity. So um, my personal journey was, you know, as I was growing up, I grew up in the Southern US and with the, all the traditional values associated with being a man, being a boy, uh, the traditional masculine roles and things like that. And at the same time, I was also this sensitive kid. And I heard this more often than I really cared to hear it. Oh, you're too sensitive. You're too emotional. You're too this, you're too that. Men, boys don't do that. That's something that women do. That's not what men do. And so I've lived with this dichotomy of trying to be who I am and being living up to this expectation about what masculine is and what masculinity is. And so it wasn't until, gosh, I was probably close to 50 before I picked up Elaine Aaron's book. So I had gone through all those years working at corporate and all those years growing up and living, having kids, being married, all that, not even knowing this existed. I knew I was different. And it was something that a lot of people in my family had. It was because it, it is genetic. Um, so it was so refreshing to read about it. But the problem was I still couldn't get it in my head to identify with it, right? It was still, there's that word sensitive. You know, I, I, I'm, I check all the boxes on it, but I just don't want to carry it forward. It's just not something I think about for myself. So when I left corporate back in about uh, 2010, 2011, and started the business. Um, that was a, a, a time I had more time to reflect on this and more time to think about this. And in around 2016 or so, I actually started writing about it uh, in the blog. And that was a great healing tool for me. It was also a great way of getting in touch with my deeper self, right? And, and learning more about my core. I had lots of questions. So I wrote blog articles with those questions. I would pose a question and go research it and write it and so forth. And as I started to build material, I eventually said, you know what, this might be a good book because there really aren't a whole lot of books out there on highly sensitive men. There's a lot of books on high sensitivity written by a lot of great people and there is a lot of material out there, but there isn't as much on highly sensitive men. So I thought, why not try to fill this gap, put something in there? And it was an experiential book. It was not, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a, you know, a, a, a paid psychological researcher, but I did, I think, a pretty good job on describing my experience. And what I've found, Maureen, is that the men who've read the book, who are highly sensitive, said, man, right on. You hit it just right on the head. That's exactly what I was feeling. That's how I felt growing up. That's how... Uh, my experiences were very similar. And you know, the funny thing about it is from all over the world, it doesn't, it's not just people from America, from the United States, it's everywhere. They're saying the same thing. I can relate to your experiences. So it's kind of a universal experience that highly sensitive men have. So that's kind of where I've gotten to, to this point has gotten here as an author and now somebody who um, is heading into uh, much like yourself, maybe coaching and mentoring uh, an advocate for highly sensitive men and an activist for highly sensitive men to help raise the awareness about that. I really, I'm, I'm just, like I said, I'm so thrilled that this is coming to awareness. Now we throw the word empath around a lot. Is that the same as a highly sensitive person? Well, let me put it to you this way. Somebody asked me this the other day. Um, 
there's a, a strict definition for what highly sensitive is, and I'll go over that in a second. But uh, what I, I my personal take on this is that uh, all empaths are highly sensitive, um, but not all highly sensitive people are empaths. So it's a it's a matter of degree, I think, that when you get into that level, that um, you know you you start separating out a little bit, and there's more that you pick up and in, in, intuitively, I think. Um, and highly sensitive people have a, a high capacity for picking out things out of the world around them. It's a kind of an awareness. It's a sensory awareness too. I like to describe it like um, if you have a camera and has an aperture on it that lets light in and the more open the camera, the aperture is, the more light you let in, right? Well, that's the way it is with highly sensitive people. Our sensory capacities in terms of, of being able to process sensory information is a little bit more widely open. And that gives us the ability to sense things that other people would miss. And it's a, there's an evolutionary reason for that too. But that really is the thing that distinguishes highly sensitive people's that ability to pick out things in the environment. Um, now, Dr. Elaine Aarons, and real quick, I'll go over this, uh, just sort of set the level playing field here for what high sensitive is. She uses an acronym. This is all science-based stuff. It's called DOES, D-O-E-S. And these are the four main characteristics of high sensitivity. The D stands for depth of processing. We're very deep thinkers, very deep feelers. Um, we take information and it goes down deep and we churn and churn and churn over it before we, we come up with whatever it is that we've concluded, whether it's a creative idea, a solution to a problem or whatever. We're very deep processors of information. And sometimes that requires us to kind of withdraw a little bit to process that information, right? Uh, so we don't appear to the world often to be these quick decision makers. We very slow to do that, but it's a very important quality that we have. The O stands for overwhelm because we all that deep processing and all that great emotion that we process and so forth, it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of brain energy and a lot of brain, because of an IT guy, CPU time. It just really definitely is something that can overwhelm us from time to time. We need downtime to sort of recalibrate. The E stands for emotional content. We're deep processors of emotional uh, information. Sometimes we're a little emotionally overreactive. Uh, that's what I think a lot of people see when they see sensitive people. Oh, you're overreacting or whatever. Well, we think deeply, we process emotion deeply. So it's, we feel much more deeply than a lot of people do. And that causes us in a lot of ways to be more empathetic. So we can identify with people and we can feel a lot of times just by our observational skills, how people are feeling, how they're reacting, we kind of know that's kind of an intuitive thing as well, is to be able to see what other people are, where they're at, how they're feeling, and then identifying with them. And then the last thing is the sensory acuity thing. It's that, that sensing the subtle in the environment, right? Picking out things that nobody else sees um, because it's there and we're pulling it in and our filters are such that we get it and receive it. So those are the four main characteristics of sensitive people. Um, and to your point about em uh, empaths, we as highly sensitive people are very empathetic, right? In that sense that we can identify with people. The empaths tend to carry a lot more um, intuitive things that they pick up, I think, as well. And uh, that's something that, like I said, that uh, uh, it's it probably less on the scientific side but nevertheless, something we all recognize and we, we appreciate. Oh, those are great. I'm going to review that. So DOES is the acronym and it's the depth, it's the overwhelm, it's the emotional, and it's the sensory. And I, I, I love all of that. And I think anyone who feels like they've been sort of this HSP their whole lives as I have, I think we all felt unusual. We, we felt yes. different, like we stood out. And the negative connotation that I received was, I was so dramatic. Oh, Maureen, you're so dramatic. Or, you know, you're such a drama queen. Or you take everything to heart. And I have accreditation in CBT therapy. And one of the things is, the, one of the false beliefs is the personalization. But I think HSPs and empaths take everything personal because we feel it so deeply. And I love that you touched on that. Now, 
when it comes to our young men growing up that turn into these men, I find, you, do you believe that the duality is the nature versus nurture? Do you think that they, they start off as these HSPs and then that, you know, that programming of don't be a sissy, don't be a, such a baby and, and don't cry, but, you know, you got hurt, get up, tough it up. What do you think, how much is the impact of the nature versus nurture? Well, what they're saying now is about 60% of, of they attribute to genetics, okay? I think, I, my personal feeling is that you're born with the quality or you don't, or you're not born with it. Sensitivity is a spectrum. And whenever we're talking about high sensitivity, we're talking about people on the 20 to 30% high end of the curve, okay? But sensitivity is something that all humans experience to some level or another, or else we probably wouldn't exist without that ability to do that. Um, but uh, nevertheless, um, as boys particularly are growing up, they're getting feedback, right? And you're right about the criticism. They take it to heart, much more so. Uh, they want to conform. They want to please. They want to be the perfect male figure, right? So they work hard at doing that. Uh, but there's this incongruence that goes on here because they are more sensitive. They are more affected by what goes on in the environment. And sensory processing sensitivity is part of a, a, th a greater theory about environmental sensitivity, which is how an organism reacts in their environment. And highly sensitive people um, react uh, to changes and are impacted much more so uh, than, say, people who are less sensitive to the environment. So that could be emotional content, environmental things like temperature and noise and loud, you know, loud noises and so forth and so on can affect you in a much more different way. Um, and so that comes into play too. So you have this sort of basic set of characteristics. And of course, there's all other personality characteristics that are assigned with you as well. The prism that we look at the world through is I think this highly sensitive filter. I, it, it's, there are other characteristics I said that make you what you are. Some people are extroverted, some people are introverted. And that goes for highly sensitive people too. About 30% of highly sensitive people are extroverted you would think they'd be mostly all, which 70% are introverted, but there are extroverted HSPs out there as well. But how we interact in the world affects us at, at some point. So what happens is you're born with a certain set of characteristics, you get out in the world, and those things can either affect you positively or negatively. The research, Maureen, shows that those people that are highly sensitive, that grow up in a nurturing, supportive environment, they thrive absolutely thrive. They thrive, in fact, more so than people who are not sensitive. They're raised in a highly supportive environment. So it's sort of our ideal environment to grow up with is to be supported and, and nurtured and so forth. We become confident and we're confident in our trait and we, we go forth in the world and I think do amazing things. A lot of great creative leaders out there that we have that are highly sensitive. The converse is not true. What happens is if you're in a bad environment growing up, highly sensitive people tend to wilt. I mean, it really, and it, they move more towards um, uh, maybe higher on the neur uh, neurotic scale because anxiety, depression, things like that set in because they're not being nurtured and, and, and raised in a, an environment that they can thrive in. In fact, they use a metaphor for that. Uh, they use a three flower metaphor, which is um, for highly sensitive people, they're orchids, right? And the larger portion of the people in the middle are tulips and the people on the end uh, who are less affected by the environment are like dandelions. They can grow anywhere, right? But highly sensitive people do have to have the same kind of nurturing and so forth that you'd say an orchid did. So that's that sensitivity coming through. Now, that doesn't mean that we're fragile and that we're easily broken. But it does mean that in, in terms of that, to your point about nature versus nurture, the nurturing element is very important to highly sensitive people and growing up. I love that analogy with the flowers because 
you know, I love orchids. It's my favorite flower. And, you know, they're just so big and brilliant when they have enough humidity and they're in the right temperature. Exactly. And so that, that environment is so important. One of the things I've noticed with those that weren't raised in that nurturing environment and they say they come for coaching is there's so much shame involved and there's so much insecurity and perfectionism. That's the oh, absolutely. I, that's what yeah. I find is the three most common struggles um, that that if you're a highly sensitive person or just males in general that reach out for help because they're willing and able and ready to make those changes and be self-aware. Are there anything, is there anything else that you find is pretty common when you're not being your most authentic self as a HSP male? Well, that's, I think that perfectionism and people pleasing kind of go together with highly sensitive people um, because we're much more aware of people's reactions. You know, a, a highly sensitive person can look at somebody without even talking to them and pick up all their body language and all their, their physical cues. And they know, am I being approved of or am I not being approved of? And so they try to make that kind of adjustment to, to do that. Um, the perfectionism part is a real big thing, I think, with a lot of highly sensitive people, because we're very conscientious about what we do. We want to do it right. We want to do it per perfectly, in fact. And I'm all for trying to do something in, in an excellent way. If you want to strive for excellence, that's fine. But perfectionism is a killer. It, it, is, it, it kills in, uh, your creativity. It, krill, it kills your ability to to try new things because you, you want to do it perfectly the first time. You very seldom ever do that. So it kind of dampens your experiences because you're selectively going through and saying, well, I don't think I can do that perfectly. So therefore I'm not going to try it. Right. So that happens a lot of times with highly sensitive people too. And it, it not being able to go out into the world and experience things with this attitude, like a little kid does sometimes where they just go and they fall on their face, they get up and they go back at it again limits the experiences and I think ultimately limits the confidence that you have as a human being in experiencing life. So those are all kinds of things. And I was going to ask you, do you think that you have a lot of your clients that are male are highly sensitive? I do. And that's why I was so excited to talk to you because I'm recognizing so much that you're talking about because a, like I said, it takes them a long time to come. And after the first session, I already see a change in them because what I do in my coaching is we're not problem focused, we're solution minded. And I will hone in on what's good about you. And the minute they hear something good about themselves or I validate, oh, absolutely, you have a right to feel that way. Yeah, I right. would feel that way too. It like changes their whole mindset. And I feel like that's what you're doing for men with your books and with your brain pilots. So tell me what you do in your programs that you help um, these men along to, to really embrace their sensitivity, their, their highly sensitive selves. Well, that's pro probably one of the most important things. And I'm, I'm actually, as we're talking, I'm working on building an online class that I'm gonna host on the Sensitive Man website that's based on the second book I have, which is more of a, first book was kind of describing my experiences as a highly sensitive man. Um, and it's kind of a validation book. The guys read it and they think, oh yeah, okay, so I'm like him. So there's other people like me out there that are like this. The second book is my kind of trail guide, right? For being a highly sensitive male. It's a, a way of trying to get people to, to recognize the trait, but also take some action steps towards making the challenging parts of the trait more comfortable. And some of them are not very complicated. Sometimes you have to sort of tell people the obvious thing that's in front of them before they realize, oh yeah, maybe if I meditated more, I'd calm down a little bit. Or maybe if I went out and took hikes in nature, I would get more in tune with myself and that kind of thing. So those are the kind of things that, that I'm gonna be highlighting in this course. But one of the critical things, Maureen, is they've got to understand what the trait is. I think they kind of know like you did and I did growing up, well, I'm different. And certainly people are pointing that out to me that I'm different and they're telling me you're too sensitive and, and so forth. Um, but the thing is to try and understand 
the trait well enough that you understand what how you relate to that trait and how it shapes you in your life, right? When you understand that part of it, I think it becomes uh, easier to embrace it. And see, this is going all, you know, the whole idea of all of this is to try to get people to be, and I know this is kind of an overused term, but it, and I can't think of a better one, to be authentic, to be who you are. And for men, uh, and this is, you know, it's, it's true to some extent for women as well who are sensitive, but for men, this is a really difficult thing because you're going against what you've been taught about what you're supposed to be as a man. When you embrace your sensitivity, and I've uh, run an online men's group, and uh, one of the things that these guys talk about all the time is to be able to sit and talk with other highly sensitive men, sort of embrace your tribe, right? Get to know other guys who feel the same way you do. It's all part of that education of yourself to yourself so that you can embrace it. So you can say, look, it's okay being sensitive. I am no less a man because I'm a sensitive man. Uh, it doesn't make me less of a father, a, a partner for, for my uh, spouse uh, or to my peers um, and you know other men, but they have to get to that point. So the things that I try to do more than anything else is get out there uh, and, and so that maybe you have a listener too, and I'm, I'm sure that you do, uh, that are male, that are, that are highly sensitive will go, hey, well, that sounds like me. And that gets the process going about creating this awareness. Because I tell you what, when I was mentioning it earlier to you, that there is an evolutionary reason why nature has baked this in to uh, the human population. And it's kind of like, um, I always use the metaphor of like meerkats. You've seen those little creatures, they, they crawl up on their little uh, uh, mounds and they look around and they're very cautious, they're very careful and so forth. Um, that's kind of what we are to the human population. We're the ones who look out, we're the canary in the coal mine. We're seeing the things that are wrong with the society. And that is our function, I think, I truly believe this, that we need to step up and help guide as advisors, as counselors, as like Dr. Aaron says, the priestly caste who go out and do the sort of the spiritual psychological work uh, amongst human, uh, the human population. So that's the reason why we need our HSP men to step up. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done with men generally about how they perform in the world as masculine, uh, how we identify is what masculine is, how we treat other people, how we treat ourselves, you know, and those are all key things that I think HSP men can do. They can model that. And I, that's one of the reasons why I, I say educate, embrace, and go out and sort of evangelize the rest of other HSP males that are out there. Yes. So those are, we need them to be leaders. We need them to exactly. be leaders because they, because they have the empathy and they have the uh, so much awareness of what's going on, the different dynamics. I love that you have a men's group and your men's group is called all right now it's just uh, i just call it the hsp men's online group okay. uh if they anybody wants to join that is an hsp um you can have them send uh, their uh, then go to the website and and there's a send me a you know an email or something and i'll get you all hooked up for it Perfect. Perfect. We'll give you guys all those links at the end of the episode as well. He's got a website. He's got his Facebook, all kinds of ways that you can reach out. And, you know, with your psychology background, my psychology background, when you find a group that you feel you belong, it makes it so e so much easier to share those things. It removes all of that shame. And, you know, just like with a diagnosis, for instance, um, I have ADD, my son has ADHD, and I remember as he was growing up, I would say, well, this isn't a crutch, you've got to find the strength that, that works for you. So on the outside, people are like, oh, you're scattered, you're all over, you forget things. And I look at it and go, but I can multitask circles around people. <laughs> <You know>? so <laughs> Absolutely. Isn't, isn't it really about anything psych psychologically right. wise is accepting. I, I have certification in ACT therapy, which I think is beautiful. It's a mindfulness meets psychology. Finally, it's, it's probably the newest therapy. 
Uh, and I love that. It's that acceptance of, I, I got a gift. Instead of looking at it as this terrible thing that I was given and I can't really fit in in the world, I got this gift. And like you said, we need these men to go out there with this beautiful gift. So when we talk about our children, our male children, how do we, since the environment is so important with our HSP men when they're younger, what can the moms like me raising a 14 year old, and I know he's very, I think he's definitely, now that we're talking, I think he's definitely an HSP male. Um, how do we nurture that? How do I make him feel okay to be who he is in his sensitivity? Well, I, it's interesting. I wish I had it in front of me right now. I wrote a piece for um, uh, HS, HSP Refuge or Highly Sensitive Refuge. It's a kind of an online magazine. Things to do uh, for raising uh, highly sensitive boys. What are the things is let him be who he is. That's the first thing. And don't try to normalize him uh, to being just like the other boys are because he's not going to be that way. Um, what I like to say too, and I, I like I said, I wish I had the, it was like 14 points, but the thing is, you don't want to baby them, but at the same time, you want to encourage them to step out a little bit. What I call gently challenging them, make sure that they don't use the HSP as a crutch, their sensitivity as a crutch, not to try new things. Remember that perfectionism we talked about? You don't want them to get caught up in that stuff. Um, and the idea is to let them know, especially know that, that this is a, a characteristic that is a human trait. And I, I, you know, I have two sons. I just recently, my, one of my sons just recently had a, a little baby boy and I know he's going to be an HSP. I mean, I just know his mom is and my son is. So I know he's going to be an HSP. And I think, you know, the things that we want to get across is to let them be who they are and be okay with that and supportive of that and be able to realize that at some point they're going to have to go out in the world and they're going to need somebody to come back and talk to about things, experiences they've had that have been challenging for them. Help them understand that there are ways to deal with the overwhelm and uh, and emotional regulation. It's, it's like, it doesn't mean because you are an HSP that you can just sort of turn the fire hose on and be overly emotional all the time. There's a time and a place for everything. Uh, but the idea is we don't want these uh, children to suppress emotions, to su suppress feelings and so forth, to be able to express them, to be able to get them out. Uh, but there are tools and techniques they can use to, to regulate their emotions and these feelings that sometimes get overwhelming. Uh, so teaching them things like meditation or, or techniques that they can do are, are an active meditation thing, like uh, learning uh, 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 um, mindfulness and learning these kind of uh, what I call standing meditations, like uh, doing yoga or doing uh, uh, tai chi or something that involves the body and the mind. And then allow them to experience what flow state is, which is allowing them to be in flow, which is sort of letting things go through them. Uh, whether it's an activity, like if they really enjoy, uh, once again, going out in nature and then maybe they're a, a keen observer, they like looking at uh, birds or, or butterflies or whatever, encourage them to do those kind of things that get them into that flow state. Cause that's a really important thing for all people, but it really does help great a great deal for highly sensitive people. Those are great. I'm going to review that with our view with our listeners. So don't try to normalize them. Let them be who they are. Gently challenge them. This is a human trait. Emotional regulation, which I think is very important. And I saw that with my older son who ended up with oppositional defiant disorder. And that was really important and with ADHD. Part of that was that emotional regulation. So I think that's really key. The overwhelm, helping them maybe break it down step by step, uh, being in the flow state, I think is is gr a great idea. I, I would add for me, in addition, one of the things that I made sure of with both my son and now my grandson is that they had outlets to let this emotion out because sometimes right. they hold so much of it in it's overwhelming. They don't know what to do with it. So I made sure they were very physically active. I made sure they were doing um, sports or they were doing skateboarding or my grandson likes art. So my grandson um, has experienced a lot of trauma in his life. He witnessed a lot of domestic violence and that's why he's with us now. 
And my husband, so you can help me with this. So if there's partners or mothers or, you know, parents that don't quite understand this, my husband, I love him to pieces. He is a engineer with a very logical mind. I'm obviously the complete end of the spectrum agency, right. emotional intelligence, empath. And, and we, I find myself sort of uh, uh, mediating. You know, he's pretty, he's really harsh. He's just like, do this. And I see my grandson's face sometimes drop and I'll be like, hey, hey, let's just soften that a little bit. So how could you help someone like some they have a partner they're married to someone and they don't real they didn't realize they were an hsp and they probably were like gosh you're so emotional all the time can you not do that how do we partners and parents help the hsp male that's that's a very good question and it's funny and kind of ironic that you said that about your husband being an engineer because we tend to to wind up with people who are the exact opposite of us you know, they're not HSP, but they're very logical, uh, you know, they it reserved emotionally and that kind of thing. And, you know, they, they, they see HSPs as being kind of like I said, the fire hose that's flapping around on the ground with nobody holding control of it. Really, truly, one of the first things you need to do is uh, if you're with a partner or with a potential partner is let them know who you are. Because it's going to be difficult for a lot of people who do not understand the trait. They're going to think, oh, my gosh. I've got a drama king or queen here, or, you know, they, they have to understand that we, see, and you can present this to your husband too, is that it's, it, it's the way we're wired, you know, and an engineer would appreciate that. I don't know if he's an electrical engineer or what kind of engineer he is, but it's the way we're constructed. It's the way our brain works and help them understand that, as we said, uh, there is evolutionary purpose for this. Uh, and, um, help them understand those those characteristics that we talked about the does characteristics now on your side of the, of the spectrum here is that you're going to have to learn to be able to understand that they're not going to understand you all the time and that you're going to have to give them a little bit of uh, you know a little bit of breathing room you know um and show some of that hsp understanding and empathy um i think there's always a good compromise in between there now, Elaine Aaron has written a wonderful book on HSPs in love, and it talks about, and she is a world-renowned expert, her and her husband, Arthur Aaron, world-renowned experts in love and psycho the psychology of love. So she couldn't have been a better person to write this book, but they talk about different pairings, right? And so you could be an HSP with a, a, an HSP or an HSP with a non-HSP, and there's variations. Some are extroverted or in, introverted, so forth and so on. How do you do that? How do you make those things work? Um, and what are the challenges and what are the um, uh, things that you do that you're going to benefit from because you're with somebody on the opposite side? I happen to believe personally, this is my opinion only, is that it's good for HSPs to be with people who are not exactly like us. You put two HSPs together, sometimes I think that's kind of like mix, mixing gas and matches and stuff like that, but it's it's it works in some cases and I can see where it might. But I think the idea like you, and, and I've done that too in my previous marriages have been with people who are more logical, more, um, you know, they think in a certain way, less emotional, uh, more objective, I guess you'd call it. Um, and that does provide a little balance, right, to, to your life. It's just, it sort of helps. And I definitely believe in balance. I think balance is the key in life. Oh, 100%. I, that's my favorite. You know, balance is anything, anything that's in moderation is, is perfection. And I agree with you. I had previous marriages as well. And I think you're absolutely right. If you have an HSP with a non HSP, the being honest and upfront and transparent about it, my husband and I have had to work through a lot of stuff because I find, and, and you can tell me if you agree that sometimes you recognize you're being a little bit overboard and you're like, Oh God, I got to bring it down a little bit. Like I'm even saying, I got to bring it down. I tend to be repetitive. I, I have to process through, so it takes me a while, it might take me a week, and I'll talk about the same thing over and over, 
And finding a partner, the, the key is now that I'm with my perfect um, soulmate in Twin Flame, I find he's more willing to understand me. And he's willing to say, okay, tell me why you keep repeating yourself over and over and over. Or tell me why you can't let this go. Because we're going to look at it like a diamond. We have to look at every side, every, every right. single angle, where a lot of people are just going to look at it as a square and say, well, this works, this doesn't work. But we're like, well, what about this? Or maybe I should try this. So right. it, it gets a little complicated when you are with people that are very logistical and like do this and be done with this. So what do you what do you think about that picking that partner? What if when someone's dating, how do you know? How do you figure that out? Because I know we feel people. Well, I, you know, it's funny because I've talked to a couple of people just recently about this idea that we all tend to have this uh, ability. Um, I think uh, it's almost an intuitive capacity to just to find other HSPs. We know by just a few, maybe a small conversation, five minutes, um, or maybe the way they're reacting to things. I can pick an HSP out of a room just about like that uh, at this point. But when you're getting ready to date somebody, I think it's that's probably something you should be upfront about because it, it, it's, it, you're starting to go on this process of picking a partner because some people are just not going to want that in their life. And it's not, it's not a fault of yours and it's not a fault of theirs. They just, that's just an incompatibility issue. Uh, but I think being honest about it up front and, and sort of weaving it into the conversation, I had a very interesting gentleman on one of my, uh, one of our men's group meetings who presented this idea when he talks to people, right? Particularly men about being sensitive. His approach now is change, and I and I kind of like his approach. It's basically don't go in like a bulldozer and start talking sensitive right away. Basically, build the conversation, work the conversation, and then sort of slip it in the side way. You may not even use the term sensitive. You might use some other terms that um, don't have the baggage that sensitive has in our culture, right? That way, you're getting to, to a point where they go, oh, okay, I understand that. And they might even start saying, well, gosh, I might be highly sensitive or my uncle's that way. My wife is like that. My son is that way, whatever. They'll know somebody in their life. And then you connect at that point. That's your touch point, right? Once you hit that touch point, then you can talk more deeply about this, the, the, the topic and they're going to be more receptive. But if you lead off with, hey, I'm a sensitive guy, a lot of men are going to go, oh, and so therefore you must be gay then, right? No, 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 that's not what that is. And then you have to backtrack in order to get back to a point where you can talk to them. It's just like I said, it's an unfortunate thing that our culture has made sensitive, the word, a pejorative. And it shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't be. And so like, for example, this is the way I present it to a lot of guys. And your husband might appreciate this. If you have a precise instrument, right? You want to take precise measurements, right? With this particular instrument, then you might say that instrument was sensitive, sensitive to the thing you want to measure, right? Now that instrument may also be kind of finicky. You can't take it out in 150 degree weather, uh, or you can't take it out in the rain because it's very sensitive and precise. So that's kind of like how sensitive people are. We are nature's precision instruments in the human race. Uh, for a particular task that we nature has assigned to us. And so that's how I kind of present it to them in sort of nuts and bolts ways. That's great. That you are just making me think. So when when we watch a program on TV, a movie, um, he tears up. Or if I start talking about, you know, something that happened in my childhood that was difficult, he tears up. Or if I say something really kind to him and how important he is. So do you think there's degrees of sensitivity? Because yeah. I hear I'm saying he's an engineer and he's really logical, but he really seems to have some sensitivity. What is of course. The, the degrees do you think everyone has a little bit of it or absolutely it's it is a spectrum uh, it is a spectrum um and you know it's very possible that you know let's just say there's an arbitrary uh threshold and it's at the 20 top 20 30 percent um 
And Dr. Aaron has a test out there too on our website for anybody to take, and it takes no time to take it. And you, that's hsperson.com. Um, and he could take the test and find out how he, he rates on that. Um, but if you don't cr cross the threshold, that doesn't mean if you're 20 points down or 10 points down from that, that you're not sensitive, that you don't experience emotion. And see, it's good that your husband feels comfortable enough with you to be able to, a lot of guys have a really hard time shedding a tear at a beautiful sunset or a movie or a novel or a television show or whatever that's very moving and whatever, because we've been taught don't show emotions like that. That's not what a guy does. And the fact that he's comfortable enough with you to do that, that's great. It's a testament to your uh, making him feel is that he can be fully present as a human being and not just be this engineering, logical, masculine man who can't show these emotions. And this is one of the reasons why I say it's so important that we get our HSP men folk out there teaching, modeling, showing, giving sort of a tacit permission from other men to other men to say, look, you can feel, you can be fully human. And that's an expression of those emotions that all human beings have. Yeah, removing the shame. But don't come in hot, guys, is what, is what William <laughs> is saying. You reminded me of a date I went on one time when I was single. And we were on a hike. I was on a hike with this gentleman. And I don't know, I was talking just my normal self. And he says, he said, you're kind of a lot. Can you tone it down? Woo! That was the wrong thing to say. So do not, do not say that to your HSPs, guys. I'm just saying. I was yeah. like, okay, this is the last time I'm ever going to see you again. You're literally telling me not to be who I am. You Exactly. Can, you cannot handle all of this, okay? And then I started thinking maybe my husband is a closet HSP and his nurturing, which was no emotion whatsoever from his father. Right. His, his father had him when he was 41 and all he did was work. He was very, he was an accountant and it was just money. There was no emotional engagement at all. So I'm wondering how do we know when we have a closet HSP? And like you said, I am bringing that out. And he said he's learned so much from from our marriage that I encourage him to just be himself. He said no one ever accepted him the way that I do. And I think that's the key is having people accept yeah. an HSP for who they are. Exactly. Yeah, that's a tough one, especially for men. Um, because most men, uh, especially in a sort of scientifically oriented, factual based profession, IT was like that. And you'd be surprised how many guys in IT are HSPs. Uh, you would think, well, that wouldn't be a good place for an HSP, but it actually kind of is. Um, but people who are in those kind of scientific fields feel like, you know, we want to leave the emotion out of it. So they also carry that forward into the rest of their lives. And if he was raised in a family where emotion, which a lot of us were, where emotion was not sort of out, uh, like hanging laundry out, you know, you don't do that. Um, it's difficult to get comfortable doing that. And, and that's, that's just one of those kind of things where we have to start giving ourselves permission. Honest to gosh, I really think, you know, that our culture itself is a very masculine dominated culture. We have a lot of masculine energy in, in, in our culture, which is out of balance, in my opinion. We need the feminine uh, energy to come forward. And one of the things I tell a lot of the guys is that, you know, all men start out as females. We all start out in the, in the womb, you know, in, in the embryonic stage. We are all female to begin with. And it's over time that uh, nine weeks into the pregnancy that something kicks in, the Y chromosome kicks in and we start differentiating. Uh, into being males. So we all start out as females. So I think, and because we all come from a, a, a female to begin with, we get a lot of feminine energy that is in us all the time. But we suppress that. That's that kindness, that nurturing, that wanting to trust our intuition versus trying to do everything logically processed like a computer, right? And we deny that. And that's denying part of our humanity in doing that. And I think 
if we could soften up some of, and I, when I say soften up, I only mean that not as a, as hardness as being more strong or better or whatever, but softness like water, right? Water is something that flows, it's energetic, it shapes, it changes. Uh, uh, that's the way we need to be more of. And we need to get that balance within with more men expressing that. So it's not just about HSP men, it's about all men learning that other side. Love that. What came to my mind when you were speaking was allowing. It's the allowing yes. of just that authentic, just do what you feel, do what you feel. Stop putting that mask on out there in the world. Stop hiding who you really are. And I got to thinking, there are more single people than ever before. People are not getting married. And there were more single women than ever before. And I know when I was a single woman, um, I was more masculine energy because I had to be everything. I had to be the breadwinner. Right. I had to be the decision maker. I had to be the disciplinarian and the nurturer. So I, I'm loving this conversation. What I thought of was the balance of getting more HSP men and males to be in touch with that feminine energy is balancing out, I think, a lot of the masculine energy that a lot of the women are starting to have, you know, more yeah. feeling empowered. And I, I think, you know, over the last 40, 50 years or so, particularly since sort of as I was growing up, the women's liberation movement came along and worked towards allowing, helping women to find that that masculine side uh, to be able to, to do some of the things that traditionally they were not allowed to do. Right. Now, remember, this is not sexual. This is just energetic stuff. Right. So but there's never really been a corresponding men's liberation movement to allow men to embrace that side. Now, I'm not talking about a lot of guys may go, oh, OK, well, this guy is really off going off the rails here about this. It's not abandoning your masculine side. It's not abandoning those things that men tend to do naturally, active, protective kinds of things that men do. It's about incorporating the other part of it, the other part of yourself that, you know, hopefully one day will help shape, you know, political policy, uh, business policy, things like that, that will help change the world. And I, and I, I think we need that now. We need that kind of men's movement that allows men to embrace that other side, that other part. That is a perfect segue into my next question that I ask every um, every guest. Uh, to recap what you just said, men, it's not an either or where you have masculine or feminine. It's an and. It's a join them together, right? It's it's have a balance and the freedom to be who you are. So one of the questions I always ask is, if I had a big banner and I had a hundred thousand people marching behind you and you were going to go downtown what does your movement say? What is the name of your movement if you want to change the world for your purpose? You know, initially when I started working on this, it was mostly focused on high sensitivity and, and then high sensitivity in men. But I really believe that it's about allowing us to be human, fully, completely human, uh, because there's so much capacity that human beings have. We have such a diverse uh, population of human beings. The genetic of the human genome is amazing in how diverse it is. Allowing ourselves to be human. And that, what you said earlier, was about being yourself, being authentic, being who you are, allowing that. And I think we're, I hope, I really hope that we're reaching a point now where that's starting to percolate up from younger generations who are saying, I want to be who I am, right? I don't want to be in a box. Don't put me in a box. They're not just two boxes. There are lots of boxes. I want to be who I am and be genuine and authentic. So the banner would read, be yourself, be authentic, be human. Oh, be yourself, be authentic, be human. Oh my goodness. Left it. I got to write this down. I really be yourself okay can't write as fast as i'm thinking 
And and I think you're right. We are getting there. We are getting there. And I know that you have a psychology degree, and I think it's amazing that <coughs> our psychology professionals are now embracing mindfulness and meditation. And we're getting out of so many of my clients that come, 99% of them have been in therapy right. and counseling and said that it, it didn't work because we kept stuck in those regulations by the government of this is the modality that you have to use and here you got to stay within this. You can't share experiences, you know, in there as a therapist or um, as a counselor or a psychiatrist. And I think the, and it is no disrespect. I think what I love seeing is that they are embracing more of what I feel the life coaching has offered, which is we can do it any way we need to. Individ we're individualizing now. We're not sticking to a plan or a list. Right. We're saying, who are you? What are your false beliefs? What are your limiting beliefs? What don't you believe about yourself? Let's figure out what your strengths are and let's build from there. And I, this is the, the mental health awareness movement for me. That's my story. That's, you know, um, my, my banner is be your own best friend. Because we forgot to do that. We lost the fact that, <clears throat> and again, like the nurture, we were told, don't be selfish, don't be self-centered, don't be self-absorbed. That's what I heard in my household, like, don't be conceited. And so we kind of lost this self, the ability to nurture ourselves first, which is what makes us better to each right. other and to the world. So I'm hopeful. I draw in my fellow HSPs and my tribe that you just you bring it i always say build it and it will come the law of attraction is that which is like itself will attract and that's why you're in front of me today william oh my gosh you guys i i hope you enjoyed this because i enjoyed him to the nth degree and i'm going to give you all of the ways to reach william or do you like bill or william bill you could call me bill yeah okay William is is a very special name in my family, and I've been doing my ancestry tree, and there are Williams everywhere. My son's is that right? Name, yeah, my son's middle name is William, and then we found out this William name carried on like five generations. So is that right? I, so I'm using William the entire time, and you go by Bill, but I. That's I, per perfectly okay. I. I, I go by both. I prefer Bill, but that's I should have said that at the beginning, and I didn't. I just let you run with it, and so it's cool. <laughs> so, guys, here's where you can reach Bill. It's uh, thesensitiveman.com, all spelled out. Also, brainpilots.com, and he said that you can reach out to him to find where you can join the men's group and the support group that you're looking for. He is on Facebook at The Sensitive Man, and also uh, he's at Facebook at Zalen W, Z-A-L-L-E-N-W. And then LinkedIn, you can also find him at W.R. Allen. And I'm going to put all of these links in the podcast episode when we publish. I'll have everything uh, listed underneath. But I think this is really great, and I hope that uh, not only our male listeners, but also our female listeners who want to help their husbands and their children and their brothers, um, fathers, I, I think this is such an amazing movement, and I think it's time. I think it's long overdue. Uh, we're shifting roles in society. We are finally becoming humans, and we're not specifying genders and, and sexual preferences. And we're finally, I think, coming together in inequality and inclusiveness. And that's, that's the beautiful thing about it. So my last um, two questions. First, because it's I never knew, what is the one thing in your entire life that you finally reached that point of what you never knew that you know now? I think for me, and this is going to probably weave in some of the things we talked about before, um, because when I left the corporate world, that was my safety blanket. It's something that I had been doing for a long time. And I, unfortunately, at that time, I also wound up uh, getting divorced. And so I had found myself in a situation where I felt kind of alone and, and isolated, right? 
um, stepping out into new things, starting a new business and everything else. But I think the thing that I learned more than anything else was to trust your own intuition. Um, because at your core, you know what is right for you. You know what is good for you. And a lot of people say it's listening to your heart. It's the same thing. It's a, a sense of self that is deep. And spending time learning what that is, is the thing that I think uh, is most important, uh, especially for people who have a pause in their life where they're thinking, what do I do now? What can I do? I'm not happy. I want to do something else. That's where you start. The other thing is I kind of been incorporating the Taoist principle of Wu Wei, which is the act of non-action. Um, and just which for most Westerners, that doesn't make any sense at all. But um, it's sort of like letting go, letting things go. And that's the other part about it too. Once you've created something, an idea, an intention or whatever, you're working towards it. Don't fuss over it like a helicopter parent, right? Let it go out and, and find itself in the world. Be a part of the flow that makes that happen, but don't try to control every aspect of it. I, so that's what I would say. I, I agree with you 100%. We need to be human beings, not human doings all the time. And it really is the more at ease you are about something, the more joyful and feel you feel better about it, the quicker it comes. And we think as humans, I got to hustle. I got to force this thing. I have to, oh, I got to every day plan out every minute of my day. And right. I agree with you. I have found that um, even this podcast was a great example of that. I wanted to start it at the beginning of the year and I was terrified of technology. I'm just, I'm an old school girl. I can't help it. I'm cassettes and beepers, you know? And so I had this fear of technology and I was creating something one day. I create these mini houses and I heard it. I heard my intuition say, go start the podcast. And I look around I'm by myself and I went, what now? Yeah. Go start the podcast. I started it that day and it has been the most beautiful thing I've ever done. I feel so fulfilled and it's the peace that was missing since I quit corporate. I'm like, I haven't quite felt as fulfilled as right. I need to. And it was just a limiting belief that I couldn't do the technology. So and, you're right. And now look at you, right? <laughs> I, I love it. This is every day, every day. I am like, I get to. I get to have a conversation with Bill today about something I don't know. And, yeah. oh, that's just so fun and joyful. And I always worry, what if no one wants to listen? What if no one wants to be a guest? Every day, it's 20 people reaching out to be a guest. I, I, it's coming. It's flowing to me. Yeah. And that's what we want everyone to hear is the more at ease you are with something, build it, and they will come and get into the vibration of it, and it is brought to you. So my very last question I ask everybody is, what is your shameless self-indulgence that you do for yourself? Oh boy, um, that's a good question, right? Because <laughs> right now I'm so focused on building things. I, I, th I think I like to do road trips and I because it's sort of like, it's, it's, it's kind of funny because I, I had a, a girlfriend here that I live in Florida. She was in New Orleans, and I, it's a nine and a half hour drive. And those were much some of the great experiences driving that nine and a half hours because I had lots of time to think and spend with myself. And you're in a car, you're in like a time capsule anyway. So uh, it was it, it was just something that I really enjoyed doing. I need to do more of that. I love to travel, and with the pandemic and everything, it's limited a lot. But we're now kind of opening back up again. So I'm really really looking forward to doing more on that. Yes, I love that. That's a great self-indulgence. It's amazing to me every time I ask that question, how how different we all are. Yeah. And when, and when someone says, oh, I don't know, I'm like, uh-oh, we're not doing enough self-care here because you know that thing that you just love that when you, you think in your mind, when I have free time, I'm going to do this thing. So you have to do more of that. And I'm with you. I love traveling and road trips and just getting outside of your own world and, and really observing. And as HSPs, that's pretty obvious why we right. like that. You know, yes. Yes. We, we're observers and feelers and we need to be stimulated a lot. So yeah. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Wi uh, Bill. I was going to say William again. Thank you, Bill, for your time today. I'm so grateful. I always say you, that was an hour of your time that you can never get back that you gave to me. And I'm so grateful for you and all of your information. So listeners, please, please reach out to Bill and, and connect with him. If you know someone you think could benefit from this or you are someone that could benefit from this, he is just a wonderful man with a wealth of information for you. And if you would like to reach out to me, if you have any comments on the podcast or you'd like to be a guest or you would like to seek life coaching or buy my books, my dog is more enlightened than I am and my dog is my relationship coach on Amazon. I thank you all for listening. It's been a complete joy to have him here today. He just made my day. So thank you, Bill. Great to meet you. Stay in touch with me. And I just know the listeners are going to love this. So everybody have a beautiful, beautiful rest of your day. Thank you.